today we have a, a very fun panel. Starting on uh, your left is Mary Gidding Daxton from right here in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, Mary. And next to her is Timothy Weldon. I call him Timmy, but Tim Weldon from, uh, from Galisteo, New Mexico, which is a cool little art village in the Santa Fe area. And then we have right next to me is Myron Whitaker, all the way from North Carolina. And as some of you know, Myron doesn't usually do this, but um, we use some persuasion. And here it is. So we're gonna have, we're gonna have a good panel today. So uh, the topic is mixed media and how some artists have the ability to take a variety of items and put them all together to create an own, their own unique uh, work of art. And uh, we've got the extra media of wind today, so hopefully, uh, don't be don't be alarmed with Mary's things blowing in the wind. But um, it's going to be fine. So um, we'd like to have each of the artists uh, take a moment to introduce themselves, share with us a little bit about how long they've been doing art, and um, take it from there. So Mary, I'm going to start with you. I'm Mary Giddings. I've been making art my whole life for a living since I was 23. So it's a long time. I started in a sweatshop. Um, and I live in downtown Phoenix. Um, no, that's it. Okay, we'll get, we'll, get, we'll get more out of her about how they make everything that goes into their creations. And you do work with your husband, Joe. I do work with my, there's my husband, Joe. Hi, Joe. Hi, Joe. We figured we, he, he can contribute here and there if he needs to, but we, we got Mary up here, so. All right, Timothy. Uh, I'm Tim Weldon. I live in uh, New Mexico, just outside of Santa Fe. Hollywood. <laughs> uh, God, I've been doing art since I was about three years old. I danced uh, for a living. I've, I was in the music business for many years, uh, over, over 15 years, and I started painting again, painted as a teenager, uh, but started painting again at about 35 years old, and now I'm about 63, and um, this is what came out of me when I started painting again, this style. Years ago, I used to paint kind of portraits and landscapes of places that I wanted to go where I thought I wanted to live. I wanted to like, I thought I would write a book and live in Vermont and have a covered bridge on, on the property. And so I could visualize that because I think manifestation, artists manifest things. My work is definitely a manifestation of, of my, uh, my thoughts and ideas. And, um, so it started out as landscapes and, and portraits, but all my experiences life led to this stuff. Which is super fun, and I'll tell you a little bit about his studio later, which is a great experience. Okay, right next to me is Myron. Tell us a little bit about you, Myron. Myron Whitaker. Uh, uh, I live in North Carolina. Uh, I haven't done a lot of art as long as they have, about 18 years. I've been at this show 15 years. Uh, so I, my kid left to go to college. I went back and found something new to do, fell in love with it, worked for Mercedes building 18-wheelers for 16 years. So I uh, quit that job and started doing this full time. So uh, having a blast, loving it. Uh, it's introduced me to some of the most creative and fun people you could ever have as friends. That's true fact. Well, this building Mercedes has an art form all its own. Yeah. So, And we have, it's interesting how many artists we have that had more of a scientific or engineering background prior to moving into the creative side, which is always very interesting. And I think that contributes to the balance of your pieces. So yeah. So um, again, so mixing media, that we have a lot of artists who when we're putting them in a category, we could say mixed media because they may do painting and they may paint in oil and watercolor and they may also sculpt. But today we're really focused on people who combine media into one piece of art. And um, Mary, I want to start with kind of your creative background because you and Joe literally make 
almost every little piece that goes into your art, and there's a lot of different mediums in there, from glass to um, ceramic to paint to, to metal. So how do you put all that together? You know, it's all, even though it sounds so different, this is, this is iron here, this paint, and this is iron. And the, the dark color of my clay is filled with iron. So even though they're different mediums, I, I really love iron and copper, uh, which makes these glazes. And I, I found myself wanting to make this kind of a glaze that's gone through a high fire kiln, but with paint. So I'm working with a lot of the same chemicals, but instead of fire, I'm using acids with the metals. Um, I, I don't know, I love texture, and I love um, fire, and I love decay, and um, I think this is a celebration of decay. <laughs> you know, it's a tarnish and acids and... Um, so explain yeah. that a little bit. You're, you're using natural elements of iron and copper to create color, and you're also using those elements of iron and copper in the collab or you know the building of the project. Right, right. So without iron I can't do any of this. So I need a lot of metal in my work. Um, I used to do mixed media painting. I paint on papers and rip them up and collage them and make these big collage things. Somehow doing this show, I stopped working with paper and began making all of those bits out of actual things. The metal, the clay, um, the glass, and, com and combining them. In a way I was doing with paper years ago, but I don't know, I feel like I made another leap into sculpture doing this. Oh, absolutely. That I, that I enjoy doing. So your kiln, how, how many hours a week is your kiln running and are we doing glass and clay? Yes, I do. I do glass and clay. So I have. I used to do much bigger glass pieces, and I would use the bits that were left over, my scrap, to make these little covers on the screw heads. Now I buy giant sheets and cut them in to make bits. I don't do the big things. I just make these little. So I have a couple of glass kilns for that, and then I have. I have several ceramic kilns where I fire these parts and larger pieces that I do. I do animals and large heads, and I think I can go as high as 30 inches in my kiln. Um, so I wind up stacking so I can get taller. And so again, the kiln's going how many hours? Well, right now there's a kiln at home candling some pieces, drying them. Um, I'll fire it over the weekend. Um, I have other pieces in various states of wetness and dryness that will go in the kiln maybe the next week. Um, there's the first firing, uh, the this firing, and then there's a second firing with the blaze. Um, so I don't know how many hours. I guess maybe 25 hours a week there's a kiln going somewhere with my work in it. That's pretty exciting. And is it uh, electric or? Uh, the it's dry, everything fires originally in an electric kiln. Well, it's low bisque fired. The second firing is happening often in a gas kiln in a big gas production. Okay, so can you explain the reason for two firings with the ceramic? Well, when you when you first make a piece and it's wet, it will dry to the touch, but it will be very fragile. So the first firing, the bisque firing, stabilizes the molecules and it burns out all of the water. The physical water and the chemical water is burned out. And, you, and your piece is, um, it's fired to, but it's still not as strong as it will be after you glaze it and put it in for a second firing at a higher temperature. Um, and then the piece becomes centered where the molecules come together and it becomes stronger. Um, and the glaze on it makes it even more strong. So it can, so 
so something like this could be outside for a long time because it's been high fired and it has a blaze and there's nowhere, no, nothing porous to, to take moisture. Awesome. Okay, and so with your glazes, you mentioned iron and copper and chemical. So the difference between uh, chemical glaze and then sometimes your painting? Well, it's, it's all chemical. Uh, this happens with heat, though, uh, this glaze. This one happens with acid. These happen, this is acid and metal. So it's also having a chemical reaction. And it, it breaks down the metal, and then you see all this beautiful decay that I love. The celebration of decay, I like that. You know, it's, I don't know, it, there's something, it almost looks like a universe to me in the decay. Thank you, that's very good. We'll learn more about your studio, because I know you're, you're, I can't imagine like how much you have going on in your studio, mm -hmm. it's a big studio. So, um, and, and Tim, I love your introduction of when you came back to doing art, this is what you came up with. What does that say about you? <laughs> I, guess it, I guess it says I'm kind of complex. And you're fun. I, didn't think, I, I thought I was a pretty simple guy, but I guess I'm more complex than I think I am. Uh, no, I, I, I think I've been doing it all along, actually. You know, when... Being in the music business, I traveled around uh, the country and some of the world, and every time we had days off, I would go to museums or art galleries, and I always thought, because I'm self-taught, I'd go, oh, I, if I painted again, or if I did some kind of art, I would take a little bit of that, and then I would take a little bit of that. And so it, it kind of evolved over time, where you put it in a pot and make a gumbo, a gumbo of, of stuff. Um, whether it's paint, whether it's uh, found objects here. Oh, uh, I love the patinas. Mary hit right on the, uh, the natural iron. The patinas of the recycled wood, they have great color. Uh, the color of the game, the, game, the horse racing game which then I had to use the little horses from the game up there. This brings back so much memories for probably all of us here. And I make, I mean, you play and I make them interactive, you know? Uh, and the, the hunt, to find all this stuff, that's the best part. Treasure hunting. Who, who loves to go looking at, you know, flea markets and garage sales and, and you know, uh, antique stores? She turned me on to one a couple of weeks ago. We just went two weeks ago, two weeks out. For five years, she's been trying to get me to go there. And I went there and I scored. <laughs> you know? Uh, uh, yeah, you knew I would. And uh, so this actually, the no fishing site comes from Phoenix. I painted over it, it says, no fishing city of Phoenix. That just made like, where are you gonna fish in the canals? It just made, it was like, I, I, I thought, I go, that's so appropriate, that's coming with me. I have to make something for this show. So I call the piece, No Fishing Downtown. Uh, you know, and what, can, what does that mean? What does that mean to any one of you? It could mean a lot of things, you know. Um, and then I always incorporate, in a piece like this, I always incorporate something that you know it's my work. Meaning this little character on a piece of vintage sheet music. And if the title of the piece of music, because I pull out boxes, I have boxes and boxes of vintage ephemera, and I reach in and I grab it, and if the title hits me, that's the piece that gets used. Um, and this one says, My dreams are getting better all the time. You know? So this show has really allowed me to explore this type of work more than anything else. I'm really drawn to the work of Robert Rauschenberg and my favorite assemblage com combine artist. That's what I actually consider would be a combine artist that combines all the elements. Instead of just assemblage, I'm actually painting on it or combining my work with it. Robert Rauschenberg was coined for that, uh, that type of work. And my favorite is somebody that not too many people heard of, a guy named Raymond Saunders who taught, uh, I think until recently, at CCAC in, in Oakland, California. 
and I was knocked out the first time I saw this guy's work in eighty. And I've been kind of trying to figure out how to get there. His was more Asian influence, uh, but his use of found and how he broke up the, the, the pieces, I kind of leave the pieces intact, the word downtown. He'd split it up in three ways and put it two different ways. So you'd almost like a puzzle, so you'd have to kind of try to decipher where he was going with the piece. Um, I'd probably like to try to get there a little more abstract. Um, but, but I'm still learning, I'm still trying to uncover all this stuff, you know? And the materials help me do that. So the nostalgia and fun, I mean, I don't know if you can see from far back, but the top has all these horses from this racetrack for horses. I think, I think games used to be a lot more intriguing when we were younger, not all on a screen. I mean, talk about connection, Twister, you know, we connected. And I didn't have, I didn't have games, because we, I come from a big family and we didn't have, we didn't have any money. I mean, it was, it was, it was tight. Um, and so, I think I'm kind of, I have my toys now. So I play with them, and once they're done, once they go out into the world, and somebody buys them, I'm done with playing with them. Or I'm done with playing with them, you know, looking at them on a shelf, but I didn't have them, so it's, maybe it's a way for me to, process what I didn't have. <laughs> what about that time your dad took you out on a horseback ride? Uh, no, no, no. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, we moved to New Mexico uh, when I was a teenager and my dad, he thought, all of a sudden, he thought he was wired up. He never wore a pair of jeans in his life. We're from Brooklyn, New York and, and uh, he never wore a pair of jeans in New York and, until we moved to New Mexico. And, it was 19, you know, the seven, mid 70s. And uh, he, all of a sudden he's got the cowboy hat, the jean jacket, and he had square toe boots and a pair of Wrangler jeans. And, and he gets himself a gun with a holster and he's, he's like, you know, he's trying to teach me. And he brought me a 22 rifle and he's trying to teach me how to quick draw a beer can or a Coke can off the fence post. And he, no, he with the with the pistol. He had it, you know, he had it loaded in the hip. He, he thought he was a gunfighter. He really thought he was something, you know. And it was comical. If he knew my dad, it was very comical. And he pulls it out and he shoots himself in the leg. <laughs> and it goes in the knee. And out. now I'm fourteen, fifteen years old, and we're in the desert, and I have to drive from home, and the roads, you know, they're like. <laughs> you know, and I'm driving down this dirt road, and he, but he pulls a John Wayne. He's like, ah, I think I shot myself. Like he was going to die, you know? And, and uh, so I, I, it was closer to get to the house where we were living than it was to get into the, uh, get, get into the hospital. And I walk in the door, and my brother, who used to write songs about my, my father calling, you know, my, my name is Tom, Tom McCann, the organ man, and, and he would make up these songs about my dad, and he just, I came in and said, Dan, dad shot himself, and he and his friend looked at each other, and they just busted out laughing. <laughs> and I, I got on, you know. So that was the kind of stuff, those little adventures, uh, that also led to this kind of stuff. I'm not getting that. You know, I think the first assemblage I ever did after not painting for many years, I was in a place in, outside of Syracuse, and there was an antique show called Beltville on Highway 20, and I found either a Life magazine cover or a uh, Look magazine cover. And it was, you know, men don't like to be told what to do by their wives. You know, my mom used to say, Tommy, pull over, you need to get gas, you get below a quarter of a tank. You go, don't worry, Joan, I got a five gallon reserve. And he would run out of gas every time we went on a weekend trip. And, and so, you know, so we moved to New Mexico, we never made it to these places. We'd wind up in the, on the side of the wall, rode with a picnic, and he'd be with a gas can, be gone for hours. But I realized he did it, I realized he did it purposely because my mom talked incessantly and it was the only way he'd get peace with, from the kid's family. He never seemed to mind. <laughs> and, anyway, on this look uh, uh, cover, I hadn't done an assemblage, and I'm looking for a Life Magazine cover. It was a guy on a southwestern landscape road. You know, the rocks, the sky, 
beautiful graphics with a guy with a net with a gas can. <laughs> and then in the inside portion of it, it, the story was he didn't listen to his wife, you know, to get the gas. And I said, oh, I gotta have that. That was the first piece I ever collected of collage material. And it started, it was like, uh, after you haven't done anything for such a long time and you're kind of looking at stuff and you're gearing up and it's your time to kind of bust out, that started it all. That piece of paper, uh, cover, the magazine cover, started all, and I built, you know, made that piece, and to this day, it's one of my favorite pieces. I did sell it. Uh, I had to. <laughs> you know? uh, but it did go to my ex-brother-in-law in Dallas, and I saw it recently, and it just, it brought a tear to my eye. But, but he, you know, he, he's also my favorite uh, brother-in-law ever, you know what I mean? He's a cool guy, he deserves to have the piece. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was all oh, that that story. I mean, I, that I it, it just my these adventures when we moved to New Mexico, were, there were so many, and it was like a cartoon. It, 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 I mean, you know, you can't make this stuff up, you know. And but it really colored our lives. It made our lives better, and it made uh, it made us do art. We all really kind of blossomed creatively, all my siblings, after being there, but I didn't understand why we moved there in the first place until I hit about 35 years old. And when I hit 35 and I went to Santa Fe and saw a concert, it was a full moon, and the sheriff was up on top of the natural amphitheater on horseback, you know, and then the full moon in silhouette. I was like, I get it. Dad made it that was the best thing he ever did for us. He got us out of New York and he got us to uh, experience something new and different. And I found this out later, that I didn't really know this, but he was an amazing photographer. And, you know, and when his mom and sister came from Scotland to the United States, their first place that they wound up was Arizona, of all places. And they told him stories. And he already had in his mind from those stories that he was going to move to Arizona. We never, we didn't make it to Arizona. We wound up in New Mexico because they were advertising on the Bell Parkway in Brooklyn. Come to the land of enchantment, and they suckered you into buying some piece of property in the middle of nowhere that was never going to get developed, and still isn't. You know, <laughs> you know. And uh, but he wound up in, he wound up passing away in Tucson, so he did get to spend some time in Arizona. And uh, we, initially we went there because my little sister was ill and she passed away at five years old. But the air in the United States back in that time period was the cleanest in Arizona and New Mexico. Uh, and so it was supposed to be the best place for her, but she didn't make it. And uh, I'll never forget, it was like my mom, like it was yesterday, she said, okay, Tommy, we can go now. And she left her family and she had a big family and they were partied and it was, you know, and we moved and we moved to this town, Belen, New Mexico, there's nothing there, you know, uh, coming from New York. And it, it, was a, it was a very tough adjustment, but it was, again, it was the best thing he ever did for us. Okay. I love that, I love, and you know, true example of childhood trauma can lead to amazing creativity. Oh, I think so. Channel. Well, I, I think that, I don't think you can be truly happy unless you have feel, felt sadness. I, I don't think that you can be uh, truly successful until you've tasted failure. Uh, and, and, and that, you know, there's, a, I guess, I, how would I put it? Um, not so direct, like a direct response to that, but, but there's something about that. I think that you have to feel either tragedy or something to actually get to that pinnacle of, of feeling happiness. And I think us as artists, we're, we're blessed that we get to do what we do and you know, try to uncover things. So we, you, have to, you can't take it for granted. You, 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 every day you get up and you, you go, oh, I get to do this, you know? Uh, and so you keep moving, you keep pushing forward, you know? That's awesome. Love it, thank you. Got it. I love those stories. Uh, okay, my friend Byron, I first met you, what, how long has it been? 15? 
or 16, 15? 15 years ago, you, you came to the show. And um, like many of our artists, you, you didn't have anything nearly this big at the time. He was doing much of what we still see, uh, the smaller vessels using beautiful glazes. Um, but to watch you evolve and to see the kinds of things that you incorporate, um, truly mixed media. But it all starts with the clay in your studio at home. Or does it start with the artifacts? With the stone. I, I actually find the stones first, the Brazilian agates, and then I design the piece from the stone. So I use the stone for inspiration. Oh, hold it really close. close. <laughs> but the colors of the piece are the every object that I use on the piece comes out of the stone itself. Uh, the blue one over there, I had that stone for two years. I could never figure anything out to do with it, so I had to create a new glaze. So I made the blue glaze to fit the stone instead of having a glaze to find a stone to fit the glaze. So I formulated my own glaze. And, uh, so I change everything all the time. But it's all based off of the stone itself. So your glazes, that's a little bit like being uh, having a recipe, because you, you have a lot of different colors, yes. and they're made up of different pigments or Chemical, chemicals? Chemical bounds, yes. So do you keep a book? Yes. A recipe I, Right now, most potters do five or six glazes they formulate out. I'm at 58. Uh, I've formulated 58 glazes. Uh, because I like I like to be so different than other potters that they can't keep up with what I'm doing. <laughs> so, when you have to when you're in an open field like this, because uh, like today I have someone walk through with a sketch pad, sketching my pieces instead of taking photographs. Wow. So it's just part of what you do. Uh, so you have to look at it and uh, appreciate it and just keep moving on. So do you have? I mean, your work is. One of the great things, I, I would say, uh, all of these works of art, we've seen go to homes and have a, a wide variety of styles. So there's something about more of the contemporary feel, yet still organic, that really lends itself to many different types of de design, kind of as we talked about last, last week. But, um, what I love about your thing, you have such a variety of sizes or something for everyone. We can all get a small little piece that has either stones or they all, have, they all have the same elements. Yep. From a 10 inch piece all the way up to a 6 foot tall piece. It's all the same elements. Together. Which are? Brazilian agates, clay, and glaze. And it's just all put together in different ways. Yeah. And, um, Again, you, your work can transcend into all different styles of homes, and these vessels can make a huge statement. Do you have some any favorite stories about a home where you've landed, um, where you felt like, wow, this is a perfect fit for this place? Yeah, a lot of them. Uh, this last week, I was up in the boulders. Uh, she bought one of my biggest pieces I had. She didn't know where to put it, so we put it in the guest bedroom. And she was like, only my sister ever stayed in here, so she was the only one that'll ever see it. <laughs> but she wants me to make two more eventually to put in the main part of the house. So, you know, it introduced to all of it together. And then, um, do you um, collect, like, what do we have in here? This is, is this wood or, because I know you use quills in some of your pieces the wood, too. The spike in the front is wood. The black straps you see is leather, and the black straps holding the wood on on that one is actually uh, electrical wire with the uh, insulation still on it, so it's copper wire with insulation. Uh, and then the rest of that is ceramic with the stone on top, the Brazilian agate. Okay, so talk about this piece. Do you, the agate or the stone dictates what the design is going to be, but then yes. is this like all the texture, like the top piece where it's smoother. Uh, I picked a rock up out of my yard when the clay was wet. I hit it with the rock, made all the indentations. Uh, the brown band on it, I used the back of a paintbrush to hammer it to make it look like leather. And then the base of it, I carved with the wire tool and carved notches out. Those pieces there glaze three times. In between each glaze, you fire it 
gets higher and higher. The last firing on that, I cover the whole piece in black glaze, and then I take a wet sponge and I wipe it all off, and then fire it. And so that's what settles in here? It fills all the crevices in that I made and exposes all my texture. Very cool. But are these made separately? These? They're, they're all made, that is four pieces. And then that goes on before yeah. the firing? I, so it, I, I, I make everything and then assemble it together. What do all your tools look like? You have stones, you have... I make almost all mine. I pick up chopsticks, paint brushes, anything. There's a different hat. I took a hammer, uh, an old metal hammer. I took a handle out and I used both. It gives different spaces on it. Uh, so I'm always making all my own tools. That's awesome. That's awesome. Is there ever um, an agate that stumped you that you couldn't figure out what to do with besides a blue lots? <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm lucky I have a, an agate dealer. He has a mine in Brazil. So he lets me come to his house. I just stand there and filter through them until I pull out something that inspired me. And I'll pull it out. And I buy all that inspired me. I bring them home and then I use them to create the new pieces. And do you ever sketch your things out first? Or? I do. I have, the big ones I have to because of all the detail. Uh, if I don't plan all the holes that I need and put them all in when it's wet, I can't put it in after. So it's all pre planned. Well, that makes sense. It's the design part. So, um, and also, you use a wheel. Yes, all of my pieces are thrown on the wheel. Uh, so far, the biggest I've done is uh, 12 foot tall, uh, 280 pounds of clay. Uh, when I first started, I got really, really lucky. The Desi Scroll exhibit was going through the country. Uh, my instructor in my college I was going to introduced me to him, and I got to do a uh, big group of work to go with the exhibit across the country. So tell us a little bit more about that person. Uh, Mike Free was my instructor. He only had one hand, and uh, he had a claw hand, so he could throw one hand. Uh, he was really good. He was an old 70s potter. Uh, he was very good at what he done. Wow. He could actually throw pots with his feet. So he would demonstrate how to throw a pot with your feet. So, wow. That's incredible. It, it, was, it was messy. And, yeah. <laughs> but that, wow, that shows uh, tenacity to, to do what I, you need I to do. I went to school. I, did, I don't have an art background. Mm -hmm. I went to school for production pottery, uh, throwing coffee cups and bowls. And that's how we learned skill of throwing more than the art factor of it. The art is just my messed up mind making what I want to have fun with. So. Perfect combination of skill yeah. and art. Like, like everybody here knows, a lot of Jack Daniels. <laughs> <laughs> a little inspiration from Kentucky. Yeah. Sometimes there's homemade, but we won't talk about that. Oh, <laughs> Mad, yeah. Can't tell all the secrets, so. <laughs> but um, so it's interesting. So you, you guys travel. I mean, Mary, you have the studio right here in town, and you can go home and work. You have to really create the majority of your work. I know you've had a, a kiln here before. You've had a wheel, but you're not doing massive pieces here. It's, it's really hard because of the um, the equipment you need. Uh, right now, I have uh, I design my own big kills and I build them myself. Uh, I've got 20, around 20 kills that I've built. Uh, Such an overachiever. Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't worry about, most potters you worry about how big you throw because you can't fire in a kill. So I build my own kills, so I don't worry about what I throw. If I haven't got a kill, I just build a kill around it. Uh, so it works out better for me. So it's easier. And your studio in North Carolina is at your the home that it's at my home place where i grew up yeah. yeah i have a huge studio my son lives upstairs in the house uh then i have it's it's a, it's a clay studio it's muddy it's dirty i never wash it it's a pig pen and it's the way i like it it's, it's fun i don't let people come over there because it's so bad it's a, it's a, but it's a downstairs walkout it's it, not it like is, you have to carry it, everything up and down it's the stairs. in the basement plus i have a four-car garage 
in us. I have a lot of room. Nice. nice. My neighbors are always wonder what is he burning now? <laughs> yeah. I'm always burning stuff. So. That's awesome. But you, you specifically live apart from your studio. Yes. I like that. Yeah, my house is two miles down the road. All right. That's so good. Well, I put my shop there because uh, my mom lived there and it was a way for me to take care of her and work too. Uh, so I was always there. And so I just kept the house. That's awesome. We love our moms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, got to take care of them. So, um, but you really, you load up your truck and you come out here every year and it's um, pretty much mostly gone by the end of the season, but if it's not, you can store it. I and can work more, yeah. Uh, I drive out here four times a year, uh, cross country. If I do a show on this side of the country, I always drive through here and I load my truck in my storage unit. Uh, it's the only way to keep enough inventory. So, because uh, it's a long ride. And I drive a big yellow box. The so big I, box truck. Yeah, it's called Big Bird. <laughs> so that means if you like something, you should buy it early because his, his work, all of his work will go out the door for sure. So, um, studio, so your, your studio, you're not going to invite us over. Even if we show up at your doorstep? Yeah, I'm the people. Okay. Yeah, just be ready. It's dirty. We don't care. That's real stuff. Okay. And then um, Jake and I were in Santa Fe in August, and we were talking to Tim, and we, you were getting ready to head out of town. I was. I was heading back to the Bay Area. But randomly, I had, okay, it's kind of, so it started as a girls' trip, and the four girls went to see Terrell, Terrell's studio, which is about a mile and a half? Eight, eight miles. Is it eight right. miles? Eight now? miles, yeah. Oh, well, yeah, and winding road. So, so the girls and I went to see Terrell's place, and Jake, we made Jake stay there that night because it wasn't time for him to be there because the girls were still there. Um, <laughs> and Tim and Terrell and their other their partners were going to a dinner that night, so we didn't get to see Tim's place, but we got in the car and I said, let's take the back highway back to town. It's more scenic and we're gonna drive by some of these studios. And so we dead end at this road and I'm like, Cal Steel, that's, that's where Tim lives. And the girls are like, let's just go, go. Well, let's just drive through there. And Galisteo is this beautiful, cool, you can tell better, but like this old artist village from way back. So we, we turn in and we're driving through and I'm trying to pull up on my phone to see if I can find his address and all of a sudden uh, Robin or one of the girls goes, there it is. So he, he's got a home and a casita and a studio and out front is artwork. So we found randomly find your house and the girls go and look through the studio windows. And, um, but then Jake and I saw t Tim in town and he said, well, I'm leaving. But if you guys want to drive by on your way out of town, he told us where the key was. So we we go to his studio and, you know, sometimes when you look at the way an artist, you know, the creativity, you might think, oh, he's it's probably a crazy mess. But it was like the most incredible find filled with all these cool finds that he's found over all this time. And, totally organized and this beautiful studio where he works with French doors that open to the garden and then we got to go in the house and it was like a treasure trove of memorabilia. Do you have favorite things like that you'll uh, never part with or? Ooh, well, uh, my stuff you mean? My work <laughs> itself? I've let so many get away that I wish I hadn't but I'm starting to collect now, uh, and I don't want to put any in the house. I want that to be other people's art that I find along the way. I buy other, I love to buy art. I love to buy art to be inspired by. I surround myself with the things that I wish I had done myself or had come up with myself. Um, and so, uh, but my, my stuff, I don't know, I think you know, we're our own worst critics, so I always feel sometimes if I do something, I could do I could do it a little bit better. Uh, I keep pushing, but when you went into my studio, there's three pieces in there that I'm not partying with, and that's why they're in there. They're big. Um, one piece is, incorporates. Uh, I love to take photographs of ghost signs. Um, 
go sign here in every old city in the country. The brick buildings that have the advertising that you can barely read, that's what's known as a go sign. So I like taking pictures of them and doing photograph transfers mixed with my found objects, my paintings, and, my, and collage material. It's, it's combining all my favorite elements, and I don't do that many of them, and there's one piece that's at the, at the place, so it would have to be somebody would have to just say, you know what, they'd have to make an obscene you know, <laughs> money thing, because I, I, I just can't part with it at this point. And then there's one with a really great frame. One of my favorite painters in New Mexico, uh, it's by James Havard, Carol Powell, uh, my buddy who lives down the road. Um, we're both big fans of his work, and, and the woman that represented him used to live in the house that we bought, that we got. She built the gallery on the property where the studio is, and she came to my open studio. She was big on Canyon Road in the 80s and 90s, and she bought James Havard to a national audience. She was responsible. And uh, she came to my open studios in October, and she went right to this other piece that I had, that I did, with the vintage frame, really big. I think the, the surface itself, the, the canvas is 48 by 60, and somebody gave me this amazing frame, you know, just chunky, and, and like something you might find in like 15th century Spain, you know, something like that. And the juxtaposition of the work, I, painting that big and finding one that would fit a canvas that big, uh, I have to keep that one, you know? Uh, so yeah, there's, now there's starting to be pieces uh, that if, if I find something, uh, you know, uh, it, it has to be something special. I had this pizza menu signed from 1968 that I got in Santa Fe at a place called the uh, Thrifty Queen, and it was on the back of a piece of furniture. We were looking for armors for the house because there's no, in the old adobes, 1885 adobes, there's no closets. You have to have armors. And uh, so on the back of a piece of furniture it was this pizza menu from 1968 where the whole pie was 89 cents. You know what I mean? And the menu was, it was from a place in, I think there was a restaurant at the bottom that said CNC Steakhouse in Albuquerque and Santa Fe. So I found that thing and I go, oh God, that's a tough one. I, I, but, but then there was another piece, a two foot piece, that was stamped in the back of the antique store of junk shop or whatever it was. And I just painted something simple with oil stick on it. And I thought I wouldn't sell it. But if somebody comes around that connects with it on the same level that you do, you're kind of willing to share it. You gotta spread the love. You know, and uh, so that one kind of got away recently, but I don't know, there's one maybe in my booth right now. It, I'm, I'm thinking of walking, you know, taking it down, so, you know. It's like children. Yeah, they are. Sometimes you have to keep one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I always love to hear, I mean, you, you've alluded to it. Um, I love to hear about what kind of art you all collect and who's inspired you. You mentioned a name, I mean, if Mary, who, which artists have inspired you and, and what does your collection look like in your home? Um, I've been inspired by many of the artists here at the tent, yeah. uh, but I do love, like him, Robert Rauschenberg and his combines. Um, I also love Gerhard Richter, who's an artist that's an abstract painter now. Um, I also, um, I love Picasso, and I love when he made the jump to ceramics. And I, when I was a kid, I wound up in Key West and seeing all of the cats and, and Hemingways and all of the Picasso ceramics, and I was really inspired by those. I just love them. Um, so, and my, my collection, I trade with so many people. I have your work, I have your work, I have a lot of Bryce Pettit's um, uh, bronzes. I love his work. Um, I don't know, I have a lot. I have Allison who used to do the show. I have a large collection of art, of other yeah. people's <laughs> art in my house. She's I, almost I, I feel a couple, I can feel, fill a couple of houses with my yeah. art. 
it's a, it's a sickness that many of us share. And it's a good thing. So, and you had, I mean, you, you were influenced by art at an early age, and really by your own admission have been an artist like your whole life. My whole life. And, and all different ways of expression. Yes, it's a, yes. I started, I, my degree in school was printmaking. I drew on large limestones. I had to use a, a big lift to roll them around. I drew with a little wax pencil, hyper-realistic. Um, and when I graduated, which is an odd skill, you know, this drawing on limestones, what am I going to do with that? So I, I stayed in college a few extra years just making art and switching around from printmaking to sculpture. Um, and then I needed to get a job and I saw an ad in the paper for a printer, a, a mono printer, um, where you just paint on a plate and run it through an etching press and get a one, one off, which is an unusual job. Um, and this place hired me and it was a kind of a sweatshop and we had to, um, we worked 40 hours a week but we were paid for 20. The other 20, we were, and I think this is a great deal, I still do to this day. The other 20, I got all my supplies and materials and access to all the sales reps that sold all over the United States. So I tried to come up with something they could sell. And this is coming out of college where I'm drawing a little thing and doing these photorealistic pictures of my mom. <laughs> me and my mom, of me and my best friend. So I had all this weird psychological stuff. And now I had to come up with, you know, something marketable. And, and I did. I painted and painted, and it took me about six months to come up with something they thought they could sell. And that happened when I was about 24, 25. And I've been doing it ever since. And then when, form you, or another. when you and Joe got married, yeah. or got together, yeah. um, Literally, that was like combustion. You, you guys brought your work together. And Joe, Joe is an artist, my husband. He was a, a, a really good photographer and a local actor when I met him. Um, he was in all the Phoenix Little Theater productions. I just, I had such a crush on him. But in theater, he not only acted, but he could also print the playbills, and he could make the posters, and he could print the t-shirts. And he painted the sets. In fact, one of our first dates was me helping him paint a set. You know, a, a, a rock wall and a, and a landscape in the background. He kind of, uh, you know, he came around like, oh, I really need your help. <laughs> smooth, job. Yeah, he, smooth. He's very smooth. <laughs> and we began working together that way. Right away, he did a few productions at the time. I would, I made a lot of the sets for him. I welded and painted and did the sets and he directed and started them. Um, and then when we left the, the, the factory, um, we kind of came up with a, a, an unusual method of printmaking where we would, Joe would do these beautiful silk screens on paper and then I would paint a monoprint and print it on top of the silk screen. And we would get four or five impressions off of one painting, one monoprint. But each one then we'd paint on a more. So it had a silk screen, and then it had a monoprint, and then I'd come in with leaf, and then I'd come in with, you know, other paints, and I just started mixing media in a 2D. Loved doing that and did that for many years. Um, and like I said, it was doing this show that took all the things we did and made them dimensional instead of, because up until this show, up until 2008, everything I painted was on paper or canvas, and we would just roll it up in, in sono tubes and ship it to people, and they'd take out what they wanted and put a check in and ship the tube back. Um, when I did this show, suddenly I had, everything had to be finished and up on a wall, and that, we're so demanding like that. <laughs> I, you know, I didn't know what to do. <laughs> and well, you right. figured it out. Well, the first thing I did was take my work to a frame shop, and it was going to cost like ten thousand dollars for what I wanted. I was like, no way! I didn't know what to do. So, um, Joe could weld. So he started welding frames, and 
and that cost a lot less. <laughs> and we could do it ourselves. You know, we could do we could be the labor and do it. And what's so cool, if you want to show them, the frames that they do, they have the squares are are they eight by eight? Ten by twelve by twelve. Twelve by twelve, okay. And so they, yeah, you can mix and match. We, so you can change them. You can just have a you can have just a piece or you can have any pieces in the frame. And then you can rotate, you can add new ones in and hang the in and one out, piece yeah. individually. And, and this is very easy to hang horizontally as well as over. Now, can these go indoors and outdoors? or This can go outdoors, but they're on patios. Like, it wouldn't want to be out in the middle of a... Not, not in the direct everything? Uh, it would be fine, a couple of rings, but these are fine outside. So, so much fun. I love that. And the, the ability to... to Create your own work of art with using their work of art by mixing and matching your panels is so cool. So, um, I want to make sure if there's something I should have asked you that I didn't that you say something. And we also want to see if we have anybody who has questions. But I, again, the idea of what each of these beautiful people do in creating mixed media, taking elements of all different sorts and putting them together in one cohesive piece, I think is, is just extraordinary. And it really, like you mentioned, the three-dimensional aspect of it, because it's, it's not just flat, it really draws you in and it, 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 it takes it to a whole different level. So, was there something I should have asked that I didn't ask? You sure? Okay. Do we have questions from our esteemed audience? Can Myron throw pots with his feet like his mentor? Can you throw a pot with your feet? No. <laughs> Can you throw a pot using one hand? I can. Yeah, I do one hand. Okay, he does one handed throwing. Is it always, does, do you ever make him crooked? No, it's hard to do on the wheel. It only spins one way. It only spins one way. How many of you have ever thrown a pot on a wheel? Yeah. I'm not good like that. I remember like coiling the clay and then rolling it up and then, yeah. But, um, good question. Kathy? For a Myron, um, how much experimentation did you have to do to do all the, you know, the, uh, the using the stones, you know, to put the, the mark, marks in the, the marks in the uh, pottery? So how, how much, repeat, yeah, how much experimentation did it take to get the glaze and matching the stone and the cutting? A lot. The glazing part is easy for me. Uh, glaze formulation is the same thing as paint formulation. You're just using a different type of chemical. And I worked in paint formulation for the company I was at. So that made it a good transition over for what I do. Uh, and I, every time I see something, I see texture in a piece, and I can see that texture on my piece. So I flip it around. It's just a matter of, uh, like I want a piece of aluminum foil and leave all the crinkles in it and then hammer on it on the piece with the crinkles because it gives me a, every time I do it, it's a different texture. So it's a good little form. So you're kind of noisy too. Uh, Hammering and stuff. Like Hammering, taking out your aggression. So Myron, how many firings do you do? When you put, when you put the agate in there, there's clay around the outside of it. I, so I how, many, it, how many firings do you I do? I make it look like the stone is fired in it, but in yeah. ceramic has a shrinkage rate. And so you pre-plan. So I put the stone in it, I carve out, take the stone back out, leave enough shrinkage rate, I fire it, pull it back out when it's fired, and epoxy it in. And then the band around it, is that another fire too? This the, band? The, the band? Uh, no, the band around, the brown band around, yeah. That's the that's clay, there is trim of leather on the leg. So the black you see, is leather that I made a trowel for and then a hole to put it in so it accents it all. So that's the one that's got the copper wire? Yeah. yeah. And this is the natural agate. Yeah. yeah. So that, yeah, I mean, you're, again, you're mixing elements, mixing yeah. media, and it doesn't all necessarily play well together in the kiln, but no, you can you put it on later. What you do it before me. I use things that you don't see what I've done. The buttons on the other piece, that's a upholstery tax on the outside. And the background is a piece of horn, hard flat. 
So it's a buffalo horn and an upholstery tag. And those so are added after, but you plan ahead of time? I plan ahead of time where there's a hole for everyone. So that's a great mixing of media. I yeah. love that. And I, I'm a little bit of a detail freak. So like when I put a button on it, I use a tape measure to measure everything oh, out to make sure they're all exactly the same spot. Because I don't like to get to the end and then not lay out right. <laughs> so a little weird. Oh. I probably, I probably wouldn't be good at that because I figured close enough is good enough. Yeah, uh, my motto is done is better than perfect, so yeah, I guess it's best that I'm not. Yeah, if I see it at the me. end, I can't quit looking at yeah. it, so it bothers me. Yeah. Good question. This is for Mary. So I'm wondering about the acid on your pieces. The acid on your pieces. So how much? Uh, issue are you having with uh, burning or what are you wearing a lot of protective gear when you're doing the acid or to I, well, I work outside and I have tables covered with plastic and I wear gloves and I don't inhale. <laughs> <laughs> I wear I wear a fan behind me growing away. So I have a fan going. How do you get it precise? I don't. I use sponges and spray bottles. Um, You're more my style. I spray it and then, yeah, I like all the imperfections and the weird stuff that happens. So I spray it and then I think I like it and then I have to neutralize it. And then I have to wash it and then I have to wait for it all to dry and see what happened. Kind of like glazing. You, you know, Myron knows what he's doing, but when you see the glaze go on, it looks completely different than it does after it's fired. And this looks completely different until I seal it until, it's, until the end. So the sealing makes it stop. Yeah. Well, the, actually, the uh, neutralizing stops the acid from going in. Do you ever? Do you, you never get burned or anything like that? Well, you know, my fingernails are kind of messed up. <laughs> I've got some holes in my pants. <laughs> Um, but no, I haven't had any, like, I haven't had any hospitalizations or anything like that. <laughs> now we know. Yeah, well, the, yeah, I haven't. <laughs> I suppose you develop a certain amount of carefulness with, within the, you know, freedom of it. Like, well, mostly working outside is very helpful. Outside with a big industrial fan blowing across my work area. It's, it's great. Yeah. I don't really have a lot to worry about. I don't do it inside. So I can't. When it's raining, I'm kind of screwed. When it's really hot, it's bad because it evaporates so quickly. It doesn't have a chance to work. So it's yeah. So the elements, if you're if you're working outdoors, the elements are definitely going to impact your uh, production. Yeah, humidity. Everything yeah. Else. How quick it blooms. You know, I love this orange color, which is hard to get, and it happens when it's humid when you're doing it, if there's some kind of humidity in the air. When it's so dry here, sometimes it's very hard. It's just dry as morning. That's so good. I like, that was a great question. Because you're really working within what you have surrounding you. So, um, That's my favorite part, too. Yeah. See, it's the same as this. I know. Yeah. Iron, iron make sharpens iron. So there. Love that. Um, so yeah, it's really fun to imagine the work in your home, and a lot of the artists will bring things out if you want to see them in your own environment, um, see how they might work. And um, all of you are open to commission work, right? If somebody needs a specific something for somewhere, um, talk to them about that. Do we have any questions online? No? Okay. Um, you guys are amazing, and I would love for all of you Um, they all they all come from the North Tent today. So Mary and Joe are just a few steps down the way here on the left. Um, and if you turn right and head down to the end of the tent, you'll find Timothy's work on the outside wall, and Myron is down at the end by the courtyard. And you can really you know now that you've heard a little bit more of their stories, you know with fresh eyes you can see. The, all the elements that go into their work and have a new appreciation and have a little fun with it. So um, thank you so much for being here.
We look forward to uh, next week. And thank you, Myron, Tim, and Larry.